Welcome to another program of U.S. Farm Report, brought to you by members of the National Farmers Organization in this area in the interest of agriculture, private enterprise business, and the welfare of our nation. Once again, it's a real privilege and pleasure to come into your home and talk with you about something that's very, very close to our hearts, and that's the condition of the farmer in this day and age. My name is Al Holzbauer, and I'm a minister at the Cedar Lake Church of Christ in Waterloo, Indiana. And with me this day is Reverend Jim Lex from Lagodi, Indiana. And we have a problem, and that's why we're here to discuss it with you. I think one of the stories that I've heard, I think it uh, very well the condition of the farmer, a story about three turtles. Now, there was one about that big, pretty good-sized turtle, and then there was a middle-sized one about that big, and then there was a little old fellow about that big, just a little guy, these little turtles, you know, that you can buy in a five-and-dime store. And it appeared that these three turtles went out for a cup of coffee. And uh, when they got to the place with a cup of coffee, why, the big turtle looked out and pointed to the window. He said, look out there. He said, why, it's raining outside. Middle-sized turtle said, well, it is. And then they looked at this little turtle, and they said to him, do you notice it's raining outside? He said, yes. And the big turtle pointed with him, uh, to him then and said, you are going home and get an umbrella. Well, he finally agreed that he would go home and get an umbrella, but there would have to be one condition to it. They would have to leave his coffee alone. Well, he, uh, they finally said, all right, we'll leave your coffee. We're not going to mess with your coffee. You go ahead. Six months went by. A year went by. Eighteen months, finally, two years had passed by. And the big turtle said to the middle-sized turtle, why, he said, no use of waiting any longer. And they both reached for the coffee cup. But when they did, from the farthest corner in that room came this little voice. If you do, I won't go. <laughs> and I think, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that probably the problem is that the farmer has been back there in the corner just not doing anything. And this, this is tragic because the problem, of course, is affecting him greater than any of us. We are interested in the National Farmers Organization. We are spokesmen for the National Farmers Organization. The purpose of this organization, to uh, put it pure and simple, is this, to unite the farmers in such a way that they can bargain collectively. In other words, that they can sell under contract. If they can get 60% of any commodity, then they can activate a master contract. This is the, the express purpose of it. Now, other farm organizations, and without speaking ill of any of them, other farm organizations to date have not done this to the extent that the National Farmers Organization desires to do it. Some two years ago, I had a young man in my uh, congregation come to me and ask me, uh, Al, what do you think about the National Farmers Organization? And I told him at that time uh, that I wasn't interested in it. I didn't have any interest whatsoever, and that as at that moment, why I thought that I probably was opposed to it. I then attended a meeting in the city of Indianapolis in Indiana, and there I had the wonderful privilege of meeting some 900 farmers, all of them interested in one thing. That's the marketing of their product. I went back home, and I studied the literature for about three months. And to be real honest with you folks, I studied it uh, to be critical. And uh, Reverend Jim, this was, this was the reason that I accepted the literature. I studied it just to be critical. In that meeting, uh, as the uh, uh, Reverend here knows, he was one of the speakers. And I sat uh, in that meeting, and I sat near the front. I usually sit near the front. Uh, I go to hear something why I want to hear all of it. You know, they say the philosophy of the American Today, Reverend, is uh, uh, he desires the back of the church, the front of the bus, and the middle of the road. <laughs> and I thought, perhaps, uh, as you spoke that day, I thought, well, uh, this is it. Someone has uh, told that priest about my presence, and he's after me, but sure. <laughs> you know, some of the folks who attend church when the preacher or the priest gets up and says a lot of things, and he seems to hit on all your sins, you think, I wonder, I wonder how he found out all that about me. And... Uh, he mentioned then, uh, Reverend Lex mentioned then, the responsibility of every rural 
clergyman. I became interested. I took the literature home, studied it with a critical eye, and after three months, uh, I was asked to give a little talk. And I'd been giving little talks in 14 states and covered about 50,000 miles on these little talks. I've spoken to, I suppose, some place in the neighborhood, 40 or 45,000 farmers. They're a great group of people. Uh, they're interested, and they're more and more are becoming interested in the organization whose purpose is, as I mentioned, uh, contract selling. Now, uh, Reverend Jim, you might tell yeah. us something on how you well, got involved and what, you, what your impressions are of the organization having been in it for some time now. About uh, five or six years ago, uh, one of the men of the parish came in and uh, asked me uh, what I knew about the NFO, and I didn't know anything about it, so uh, he asked me to go to a meeting. And it was uh, very interesting because I think it was uh, the state representative or state delegate, uh, Glenn Utley, who spoke. And uh, at that time, we also were able to get some literature and we studied it. And it just seemed to be a natural uh, because for a minister or a priest, uh, it seems like you know that everybody has to be together. There can't, no one can stand alone. And uh, uh, I read about it and uh, I went to a few more meetings and the first thing you know, I was uh, involved, very much so. And as we go around now, visiting and talking to different ones, a lot of people bring up different things that they are concerned about because they, uh, they worry. Farmers are great warriors, you know this. They worry about, uh, what will happen if this National Farmers Organization would ever get to a point where they would have contracts? Uh, uh, I think that so many times our fears keep us from uh, improving ourselves, from making any progress at all. Uh, look at our country. We sometimes are a little fearful of unions or unionism, and it's the very basis for the United States that uh, Jefferson, Washington, all these people, uh, the very emblem on the coins, e pluribus unum, one out of many, so that they realized from the very first that uh, you had to have some kind of uh, group organization, uh, and so it applies to the farmers. A lot of people are so fearful that uh, someone's going to be telling them what to do. Well, in an organized age, we know that uh, freedom, so-called, is always within limits. And it's better to have your neighbors, your friends, the people that you vote on in your own little county telling you what to do than to have someone who is far away who isn't really as concerned about the problem as, uh, as you are at home. There are a lot of fears that uh, cost, for example. How do we know that we're going to make as much money? How do we know that, uh, that the money that we pay in and dues is going to, well, we know in everything that has any future in it, like the space program, uh, the United States government spends millions and millions of dollars uh, hoping for the future. The same thing applies in the National Farmers Organization, that they are uh, trying in every way to help people today so that future generations will profit by uh, what we are able to do today. So many times we're a little afraid take that first step to find out a little bit more about it. This is all that we hope to uh, get from all of you, is that uh, you at least go seeking, that you go try to find out a little bit more about this organization. We don't particularly want you to join, just to be joining, because we, we don't want members just to have number, because for this organization, you have to be an active man. You have to be an active farmer. You have to be willing to fight for this because it is something rather revolutionary, especially in agriculture. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, courage, a lot of man, to be able to surmount one's fears and to be willing to go out and to try to work together with the other farmers uh, for the purpose of collective bargaining. Uh, and of course, we don't advocate um, violence or any of this, and I'm sure that the National Farmers Organization, that whenever there is any kind of violence or any kind of uh, things like this that happen, well, you know as well as I that uh, this never helps an organization. And so when you hear these little rumors or stories and things like this, 
This might be an individual person, individual set of circumstances, and it certainly doesn't represent the uh, philosophy behind the National Farmers Organization. Um, you travel around a lot, Reverend Holtzbar, and uh, how does it look? Uh, the, Getting more interested? I think, uh, uh, Reverend Jim, one of the things that uh, interests me, and not only interests me, but fascinates me, is that a few years ago, when I, when I first started to travel around, well, if we had, um, if we had uh, something like uh, uh, two or three hundred in attendance, well, we felt that we had really accomplished something. And yet I take note, and, and a great measure of pride, that today, uh, it isn't unusual at all to speak to 1,500, 2,500, 3,000 individuals. Uh, there's a great deal of interest being uh, generated here by the organization. Sometimes uh, individuals say to me, and uh, this is a good question, they say, well, uh, Al, why, why isn't it that more are, uh, aren't joining? Why is it that the organization isn't growing even faster? Now, uh, some of you out there maybe have never heard about the National Farmers Organization. Just uh, let me make note of this, that we cover an area from the state of New Jersey clean across the country, uh, with the exception of the two states, Wyoming and Washington, and from Canada right to the Gulf of Mexico. We operate now in 28 states. Uh, if we had the personnel, and we at this present time do not have sufficient personnel, uh, we could move into a great number of states in the next few months. Uh, the National Farmers Organization we would like to see it grow more and more, but we have to deal realistically with, you know, how people really are, not the way we expect them to react. I think one of the most interesting things I ever read was the type of minds, you know, diversity of minds, and you appreciate this, Reverend Jim. We have, uh, we have the individual. Anything that new, anything new comes out, where well, they join. Uh, they're right there. They're going to be a part of this. this. Is a new program, and they're going to be a part of it, and uh, they're all for it. And then uh, you know that, and I'm sure this applies to the members in your parish as it does in mine, uh, these individuals usually don't, uh, it's sort of like the story that Jesus told. Uh, the seed uh, falls in pretty shallow ground and it soon withers and dies and that's the end of it. Then we have the individual who uh, has sort of a capsule mind. They, they've already decided all that uh, they're going to believe on any given issue and they're not interested in listening and that's it. They used to tell us in the seminary that some of we preachers uh, were like the sealed uh, ball bearings, you know. After we left the seminary, nothing got in, nothing got out. Uh, sometimes individuals, as we talk to them about uh, the, the organization, they say, well, I belong to two or three other farm organizations, and I, I'm not interested in joining any others. I, I don't see where there's anything really being done. Uh, this is hard to, to get through to individuals like this. We have to show them uh, through our personal uh, dedication and enthusiasm that we don't have a, uh, a cure-all, a panacea, but we have something here that will work. It's utilitarian enough to work. And then we have, of course, the uninformed. And I, I think um, that this is probably the big problem, uh, those who are uninformed, and to get this information to them so that they can appreciate uh, what can be done with a united effort. I think that Representative Okonski recently said, unite or perish. And this is a very, very true. We need to, this is so, so essential, we need to discipline ourselves uh, to many of the, the problems that are at hand. Too often we live such undisciplined lives that when we do need uh, discipline in our lives, where an organization is concerned, it doesn't seem to be uh, too easy to, to uh, uh, qualify for it or to add it to our lives. We, we like to think that things are just going to happen, but you've no. never heard of anything no. just no. happening. You know, someone has to put the effort forth. Someone has to have the ideas. You know, in every other um, phase of the economy, in every other profession, they organize, huh? Every, every group. Mm -hmm. uh, I note that 97% uh, of all of uh, Americans are organized for bargaining. Now, we represent, uh, the farmer today represents uh, roughly about 3.2 tenths percent. This is voting power. and. Uh, a few of us, and I'm sure the same would apply to all those who see this program, uh, they're aware of the fact that legislation itself is not the answer. Mm -hmm. And I think the farmer out there uh, knows, uh, Reverend Jim, just as well as you and I do, that uh, uh, government intervention 
is not the answer. Bigger and bigger and bigger uh, government projects and, and uh, government subsidy is not the answer. Well, it's been proven because uh, look what we've been having, and it hasn't helped anything. And in fact, the prices are practically the same as they've been for the last 10 years, you know, in agriculture, whereas everything else has gone up. And uh, I heard someone explain once that uh, part of the problem of inflation is that uh, all the segments of the economy are not equally uh, uh, getting their share. And that every time there is a spiral or a rise, the farmer gets a little less of the pie. And whereas if this were equalized out, then everybody would get even so that the, the urge for inflation would, would be uh, lost and uh, it would help stabilize the whole economy. We, we've got um, so many things. And, and uh, farmers um, ha have been, I guess, organized to death. You know, I mean, that they have this organization, that organization. And so they almost feel like, well, the National Farmers Organization is just another, just organization. another organization. And they don't uh, have the urge to give it a try. But if they could just go to a meeting, like you and I, look what happened to us, and take their ministers along, uh, it'd be surprising how much effect they could have in their own community, how much they could learn. And then they could judge for themselves and not have someone telling them what to do. Because we don't want people to be told. We want them to come in uh, voluntarily freely, because it's really for them, uh, it's a service organization. They don't have any uh, uh, business connected with it. It's all service. And uh, once the bargaining is set up, the National Farmers Organization will gradually step out, and, and it will, uh, it's not uh, in the business to make business for itself. It's here to help and serve the farmers. And, is what we really need. I don't think that you could find too many uh, farmers today who would tell you that they were satisfied with prices. Uh, most of them are not satisfied with them, and they ought not be satisfied with them. Uh, we try to point out to them, for instance, one illustration would be on the problem of milk. Uh, mm -hmm. this, is a, this is one that has to be dealt with. Uh, we have to be realistic about it. When milk can be purchased in some areas of the country, some place near the uh, sum of 270 to 320, uh, per hundred weight and then be sold uh, up to $22 to the consumer, then the spread is far too great. And, and I would like to say this to uh, the farmer that's listening today. Uh, you have the barn, uh, you have the uh, land, and you produce the grain. Uh, you buy the truck to take the uh, animal to market or the animals to market or the grain to market. And yet, having, having accomplished all of this, uh, you fall down, and, and you just fall flat on your face when it comes to, to bargaining for what you have produced. Just take whatever you can get. Whatever you can get, this seems to be uh, satisfactory. And, of course, there's, there's a, um, an issue that probably has ne you've probably never heard of it, but I think that you ought to be told it, and you'll probably remember this if you don't remember very much about the uh, uh, program or what we have said, and, and that's this, that when you, when you permit yourself and I'm going to use the word I think that best fits the situation, when you permit yourself to be cheated, then you become involved in the immorality of that transaction in a very, very real way. And uh, when you refuse to bargain, or when you don't have a desire to bargain, and you permit this to on, then you contribute to the delinquency of the individual that you're dealing with. Uh, most of the farmers are not aware of the fact that in our poverty, uh, where poverty is concerned, that the farmer represents about 16% of it. And this is tremendous, 16% of it. In some of our states, uh, the poverty list shows in, in some of the states where it's as high as 48% on the part of the farmer. Mm -hmm. Now, this, this is a tragedy. Uh, our president speaks of the great society, and I concur with him. This is a great society. I don't know of any land that's greater than, than the great land of America. And yet, I, I can't imagine in this great society of free enterprise, any group of people who would be satisfied uh, without this wonderful vehicle of bargaining. Just can't imagine it. Labor has won, as you know, uh, uh, Reverend Jim, oh. some $97 million here just in the auto industry uh, in uh, 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 just a number. Of, actually, it was less than two weeks of bargaining. You know, a lot of times we just uh, hear it said that, well, you'll get better prices if you uh, join up for collective bargaining. But I think that that's just kind of short-sighted, that we should look to uh, 
a little longer view of helping to raise the dignity of a farmer, I, that a man can be proud, that he will get just return for everything that he does. He, he's not being uh, taken advantage of. You know, no matter how much money you give a man, if he doesn't feel pride in his bargaining, in his uh, whole endeavor, he's not going to be a happy man. And if we want truly great farmers, they have to have that dignity. And only if they band together and get the fairness, the justice that's due them, will they ever have it. I think one of our problems, too, uh, is the fact that our, we equate so often bigness with goodness. Mm -hmm. and, and this is not true. Uh, bigness and goodness cannot be uh, equated. We, we have made, and I think uh, that it needs to, uh, uh, we need to rectify this. We, we've made land cannibals yeah. of a great number of farmers. Um, the idea has been, well, now, you stay and stick with it as long as you can. And when your neighbor folds, well, you can go over there and buy up his land, and then you'll get bigger, and this will solve the problem. But uh, statistics from USDA show that this is not true, that bigness does not solve the problem. Uh, sometimes we equate uh, progress and change. Now, uh, change doesn't necessarily mean progress. Uh, it can mean that. It depends why we're changing and in what direction we're traveling when we make a change. Uh, the, the farmer today, I think, will either organize um, Reverend Jim or he'll fossilize. Yeah. I think he's going to do one of the two, or fossilize or crystallize, because he can't go on uh, in, this, in this present condition, do you think? No, and it seems like that uh, if he don't organize today, that just a few years from now, mm -hmm. somebody's going to organize. That's true. If he That's don't, true. somebody else will. And Whoever when takes they, his place, you know. When they do, uh, we're in for some very mm -hmm. unpleasant surprises, because they, there will be someone's going to step in right. here and organize, and uh, then we're going to have bigness, sure. and we're going to have change, but we may not have as much progress as we think. We pay uh, about 18 or 19 cents in the dollar for food, don't we? I think uh, it's... And Russia pays about 52 yeah. cents on the dollar. And here's something that's interesting. The farmer is getting 2% less of the food dollar today than what he got back in 1930, when we were in the throes yeah. of, the, of the worst the depression place. known in this country. So this, this is extremely sad. You know, if we don't uh, organize or do something, the uh, small family farms, you know, the backbone of our culture, really, are going to... Uh, well, in fact, this uh, one of the re recent reports said that they want to try to move the small farmers off the farm. Huh? They want to move 2.5 million families off the farm. Well, we're really... Uh, what, what, what do we value? What, what are we wanting? Uh, don't we respect the farming profession? Don't we try to uh, encourage the virtues that being close to nature bring? It seems like we're, uh, we're losing something very valuable if, if we uh, don't try to save the small farm because it, it's efficient. Uh, this has been proved over the years that even though the farmer gets less, he still manages to survive. Uh, it's practical and it's helpful to the community. It helps small businesses. This is something that we tend to forget about, that if the small farmer goes, then the small business goes, the small bank goes, and everything goes. And then along with that, uh, Reverend Jim, the thing that's going to go with that is a small town. Right. There's no question. Right. And of course, when the small town is gone, there will be no need for the rural church. That's right. You see, it, it becomes extinct. And uh, statistics show that we have uh, closed up uh, uh, hundreds literally hundreds of rural churches because they could not be supported. And this is in all religious persuasions. This right. is not peculiar uh, just to the Protestant group or one particular Protestant group, but this includes the uh, Catholic people oh, as sure. well, doesn't it? Oh, surely. And a number of priests. Uh, I had occasion to talk to uh, uh, several hundred in Minnesota and Wisconsin, and this is a real concern of these priests. Uh, what shall happen with the rural parish? And so... Uh, uh, it ought to be a concern of every individual that uh, uh, in America today. And, uh, and we're not just talking to farmers, you know. No. Uh, this, is, this is for everybody because if we value anything about our country, we know that what has made it so great is the industry, the responsibility, the dignity of the farmers. Uh, just because the farmers have become uh, less and less of the percentage of the population doesn't mean that we should just write them off because all our food and every, all our substance is uh, from the farms and 
we must always realize that uh, what we have comes truly from uh, from God and nature. And the greater the farmers are, the greater your country. I think this is the this is really the uh, challenge of the decade, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, the the, uh, the preservation of the small family farm. Uh, recently, there was an article uh, uh, printed, and uh, there are a great number of people who who do not believe as you and I do, and maybe some in the uh, listening today will not believe, perhaps, that uh, the importance of preserving it, uh, the family farm, but it must be preserved because it is part of the wharf and roof of, of our society, a very, very vital part of it. And it's going to take involvement, it's going to take some sacrifice, and this is where we get into uh, some pretty right. difficult problems, the idea of being involved. Uh, individuals say, well, why should I be involved? Let someone else do it. And you know, I was showing you, Reverend Jim, the letter yeah. about let George do it. Yeah. And maybe, uh, folk out there, what we've been doing is, is we've had George, we're, we're depending on right. George to do it. Well, George is going to do it all right, but he's not going to do it uh, so that it, it will be beneficial. Yeah. Uh, he's going to do it, and we're going to pay the tab. Yeah. We're going to pay the tab. He's going to do it for George. That's right. Yeah. He's going to do it for George, and it's not going to be uh, accomplished in a very uh, good manner, I think. One time in a speech I mentioned, I got up before a group and said I had just received a telegram that George died and now we had to get busy and do something about it. And I think that the farmer uh, needs to investigate this organization. He needs to do it now. It's an imperative that he investigate now, uh, that he perhaps stop listening to so many of the rumors and uh, get the literature and go to the meetings and investigate now and see to what extent the National Farmers Organization can help him. Right, and if he doesn't um, go just to this organization, he should go to the organizations he's in and starting ask, asking them questions. This like, is good. What are, what are you doing to help this? What are you doing to help the economy? What are you doing to help the United States? What are you doing to preserve the small farmer? This is excellent. Because if he don't really stand, you know, and be committed to something, like the old saying, he'll, he'll fall for anything, you know. If you don't stand for something, he'll fall for anything. That's very true. And, uh, I, think, I think also uh, uh, in uh, Professor Studerman's book in Philosophy of the uh, Soil and Roots of the Soil, uh, he mentions that every society, every society that has ever um, uh, been here on, on planet Earth, when they decided to rid themselves of the farmers and the farms, this was the end. Right. And this seems to me what some individuals want to do it at this yeah. at this stage of the game is to tell the farmer uh, in essence we don't need you anymore at least we don't need two and, and five tenths million of you right. uh, you need to the farmer that's listening today needs to ask the question okay. of the people who propose this and what do you intend to do with us mm -hmm. you know if we're to be moved off the land well just uh, exactly what do you intend to do with us and what are we going to do for a living uh, we we're very appreciative once again of the occasion uh, to be with you and to be in your homes and uh, if you have occasion to see this telecast uh, uh, or could see it more than once we would suggest that you do and then if you see it and you know that it's going to be shown someplace else call a few folks on the phone and say uh, there's going to be a priest and a minister talking about the national farmers organization and collective bargaining and uh, you ought to watch it we'll appreciate it and i think the people that you call and tell about it they'll appreciate it too it might be good if you have a chance to to uh, go out to a meeting. There are meetings being held all around the different counties throughout almost all the states in the United States. And uh, if you just drop in, you don't have to commit yourself. Just get the literature, and it would be certainly helpful to you. This program is brought to you by members of the National Farm Organization in the listening area in the interest of agriculture, private enterprise business, and the welfare of our nation.